So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, yeah, my name is Pavel Elkin. I'm a team lead of machine learning operations team at Forgiving Bay Data, Data Science. Uh, and I'm going to talk to do share with, with you my experience or our experience in uh, moving from uh, SaaS uh, to Converge, uh, success story from Wargaming. But before, uh, let's, uh, let me do a very brief introduction of what, what uh, Wargaming is. Wargaming is a game development company. Um, it, it, at one point of time, uh, uh, exploded the game industry with a new genre, free, uh, free to play massive multiplayer online games. Uh, and uh, there's those games are, have huge budgets and, uh, actually indeed free, free to play. Um, triple A stands for, uh, uh, big, big budget uh, games and meaning that uh, those games you probably saw the advertisement on TV and billboards, etc. So mm, probably uh, among users are some uh, players or fans of our games. By the way, just a quick question uh, for me. Uh, can you please ask, uh, answer a yes or no whether you you played anything from our gaming or no? Uh, just in the chat. Uh, Wargaming has more than 4,000 employees and we are located in more than 20 locations around the globe. Uh, Wargaming is more than uh, 20 years old uh, and it, it's been uh, pioneering in several fields, producing quality games and uh, accepting like uh, absorbing innovation from around, around the technologies. Um, so uh, that's, that's Wargaming. We deliver legendary online games games globally with passion. Uh, in terms of uh, data, what we have at Wargaming is, uh, yeah, just to give you a brief overview of the types of data data scientists are working uh, at data analysts, of course, are working with data is uh, we have millions of, literally millions of uh, daily active users, players who come to play our games. Uh, they, they come, they play, uh, they play in different games. Uh, they play uh, more than one battle a day, several people play dozens of battles a day, and each battle generates lots of uh, data points, like uh, who shot at whom, uh, who, who won, who lost, uh, which, which vehicle it was played on, etc., etc., etc. So this kind of data is being collected uh, every second, every moment uh, to our data warehouse. And to, just to give you a, a flavor of how much data and which type of data we have. Additionally, of course, we also have some... Uh, telemetry data, heat maps, etc., etc. So from the point of view of a data analyst or a data scientist, um, we have we see the data through the data warehouse, right? They, they collect, they organize, they store it, and the main technologies there uh, uh, are Oracle and Hadoop. And I'm not gonna cover all sets of you know of uh, tools that are used by data warehouse. I'm just uh, pointing is, is it how it looks like. From through the eyes of a, a data analyst or a data scientist. So Hadoop and Oracle are the main tools, of course. Um, Oracle, uh, sorry, Snowflake and Denoda uh, help. Uh, Denoda helps to you know aggregate all the layers in, into a in single presentation layer. Snowflake is a is a tool that is used by many uh, companies as the industry standard nowadays. Um, also, uh, of course, Amazon uh, and, and other cloud platforms. So this is the things uh, data scientists and uh, analysts see uh, in terms of data. Now, uh, in terms of what types of models are being built uh, at Wargaming, uh, I'm just going to cover like, the most standard cases that we have. Of course, we have more uh, smaller, smaller things, but just the, let's say, the main ones are, I would say, segmentations, various types of segmentations. Uh, this includes behavioral, like, uh, like, uh, for example, which players are tend, tend to, to play more, to play less, tend to play how active, less active, etc. There is also monetization segmentation, like uh, whether it's a player is it's a very pain person, not pain person at all, or something in between, and how it, uh, the person evaluates over time. So segmentation, skill-based segmentation, and other, various other types of segmentations. Um, 
Right. Uh, so then uh, oops, various scorings are important. For example, purchase likelihood or monetization scoring, right? Um, as I mentioned, our gaming mostly has uh, free-to-play games. It, and they are really free to play, so people can uh, download and play, and uh, they don't have to pay at all for playing. And But for those who pay, they can progress slightly quicker or um, just uh, get a nicer looking tanks, for example, or, or their items customized. But uh, paying does not uh, generally uh, add any uh, dominance in, in, in battles. So monetization scorings, are very important for the, for the, for the for the for the games and uh, this is why they, they are the core of uh, models that uh, data science builds for, for several for several games also churn uh, since it's not a contractual environment people people come and play when they, whenever they have time uh, so to indicate people who are likely to churn is very important task as well uh, to you know kind of uh, engage people more or i don't know just uh, if we know that the person for certainly living, maybe try to try to still uh, make the game appealing for him, for her. Uh, and in addition, there are lots of uh, uh, time series for casting that we do. Uh, being most like mostly active users, daily active users, various types of marketing uh, metrics, uh, measuring performance of the of, of the uh, marketing channels, uh, for casting the. The hot level uh, average, average revenue per person, and so on. So forecasting is also among the standard things that that, that we do regularly for, for games. And I should mention that these types of uh, segmentation, scoring, uh, time series forecasting is done for every game, for each region, for each segment. In majority of cases, so it, you can imagine the uh, amount of, uh, of of models that are being. Uh, being created and maintained and operated. In addition, of course, we have uh, text and video processing, like sentiment analysis, uh, topic search, etc. And this is uh, this is uh, the core of data science work that that been generated by our distributed team of about twenty data scientists at Wargame. Um, so. Back then, two years ago, uh, our main production production environment was SaaS. Uh, specifically, we had uh, three three pieces of SaaS: SaaS Factory Miner, SaaS Enterprise Guide, and SaaS Model Manager. It was an on-premise installation uh, on bare metal service servers, and we additionally have uh, had several uh, had the high availability storage grid. Uh, later, we also had the access to SaaS via in, in a demo regime uh, in the cloud. So, uh, although this uh, solution had uh, some pluses, it has, had also some drawbacks. Um, by the way, I just want to ask you, could you please answer, have you worked this task before in, in your career or maybe working now? It's one question, yes, no. And then the other question is uh, whether this task is your current uh, production environment. Just out of curiosity for, for me to understand how, how it stands now. Uh, so, speaking about the process of uh, SaaS, uh, as I mentioned, we have lots of typical models to, to bring, like segmentations, uh, scorings. SaaS factory miner allowed to quickly build um, like many combinations of models for game, realm, and, and segment. So, this is, was a strong, very strong point of SaaS factory miners. That's why we had it. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, it, it allowed to to delivery and uh, maintenance of uh, of plethora of models of typical tasks for game region segment etc. And it was already established process. We had SaaS uh, I think for uh, more than three years uh, before. Uh, however, SaaS came also with some uh, in con in, uh, some cons. Right, uh, it was not very convenient to fine tune models and processes. Um, it had to many parts had to go through. Uh, not very uh, high usability web interface without the ability to do it in text mode. Uh, also, it was hard to blend uh, any open source solution. I, I not, cannot say it was impossible. It certainly was possible. We had models that run under SAS, but were well, programmed on R and Python. But the, the thing is that the delivery time of, of those models were, were long uh, because from prototype 
to follow the mission of SAS, it took, it took, it took a while. Um, also, like SAS being very proprietary software, it, uh, it had, it was a black box and it had a strong vendor lock, uh, with it. But probably the, the um, largest, uh, uh, um, problems that, that, that come, that we saw in SAS is that it's actually very sensitive to scaling. Uh, it has a, this per, per CPU pricing model. And you can imagine that if you need to, uh, to double the amount of models, it's, uh, it's, it's quite hard to do this, this kind of pricing model. So, uh, luckily, uh, ah, one more thing that I wanted to mention about cons, it became more and more, uh, much and much harder to attract uh, talent, uh, on the SaaS stack. Uh, R and Python grew uh, in popularity. Uh, Python probably the most. Uh, so that's that was also the landscape when we uh, came across Converge uh, at a good time, at the right place. And uh, what we did with, with Converge, we probably were among the first customers of Converge, I think. Uh, and they agreed to conduct a one-year-long proof concept project. Uh, it was about 10 uh, users, 10 data scientists who worked uh, on some you know, profit concept projects trying to, to work on Converge and uh, and see how, how it looks compared to SaaS. And halfway through this year, year project, it was uh, evident that um, Converge suit us much, much better. And uh, to, to see why, uh, I'm just going to show a few, few points that are not necessarily in the order of importance, but just that so those that we saw that are are really strong points of converge for us. Um, so uh, in converge, users can free choose freely choose their uh, own stack. So for example, we had pro, uh, scientists that prefer Python or R or Spark. Uh, so converge in, in contrast to SaaS allows uh, allows using those technologies very very naturally out of the box because underneath is just a virtual machine that you get and uh, uh, whatever you install there is, is yours. You, you can use it. Um, also, the strong benefit was that as early adopters of Converge, we had a, we had the benefit of uh, talking directly to CTO uh, and, uh, you know, talking, uh, telling our problems, requesting features, and the turnaround was quite, quite, quite quick, uh, which is good. And I'm saying my hello to to Leah here. Also, uh, as, as I mentioned, one of the points of SaaS was that it's per core pricing, uh, converge comes with per user pricing, which is whatever whatever resources we have, we can, we can all utilize them without worrying uh, about per CPU pricing. So which is, this suited us much, much better in terms of, you know, scalability for, for the future. Uh, also, uh, although at that time we still had like almost everything on premise, uh, we started to think about uh, cloud and uh, more and more. Now we, we move into cloud basically. And uh, so the thing that uh, Converge supports hybrid infrastructure combining on premise and in cloud solutions is, is very important for us. Uh, and actually, in fact, right now we have uh, half of the resources running on premise on our cluster and the, the rest is on, uh, on the cloud. In addition, uh, we already saw that uh, Converge uh, flows and experiments and uh, workspaces functionality can, can cover for what uh, was available for us in SaaS. However, we also saw the endpoints and web applications as a, as a really good um, niches for, for, new, for new use cases. Uh, for example, web applications is something that um, we, we long wanted to have uh, as, uh, in addition to Tableau, uh, but with more uh, advanced or uh, um, capabilities than, uh, than Tableau. Uh, also, uh, Converge Camps, this uh, common, common line interface, SDK, and its configs are in YAML format, which means that pe people who are not very really fancy of uh, using graphical interface, they can, can use uh, pure text and, and do almost the same things that it can be done through web. Uh, in comparison to SaaS, it was much faster prototype to automate progression uh, because initial prototype is built in Converge and it's just a matter of uh, automated 
uh, so that it works uh, automatically uh, on, on Converge, also on Converge. Uh, it, took, uh, it took us two months uh, for three people to migrate all SAS loads from, from Converge, source from SAS to Converge, so to, to, to give you an estimate how, how, how much it costs, uh, or it took us to, uh, to migrate to Converge. And currently, uh, at, for gaming, there is um, there are more than 75 users. Uh, they include, of course, data scientists, data analysts, data engineers, and even the blue developers some, somehow use, use uh, Converge for their, for their purposes. Uh, now, uh, looking back uh, how, how it went through two years, through the, through the year, year of proof of concept project, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, more than a year of, of production operation of Converge. Uh, I'd like to share with you some thoughts of uh, what, are, what worked well and what, what could be done better. So uh, uh, I would suggest uh, if, you, if you want to roll out conversion at your infrastructure, at your organization, uh, to dedicate efforts to nurturing users' communities. It's, it's really crucial because it's a new technology. It, it has some learning curve. And it's good if users of the of the this new technology can talk to each other, can freely interact. So for that, we did a few teams in the MS teams, if it makes sense. So one, this internal where only uh, uh, gaming employees can uh, interact with each other and, and share share expertise. And the other was uh, another chat, which was uh, also monitored by, Con by Converge support guys and. Uh, and ladies, and uh, um, so whenever anyone had a problem, he could write to the chat and ask questions. And it was very natural to, you know, just similar to working in, in talking to your peers, you could, could easily reach to converse support. Also, we had a, uh, and have regular knowledge and uh, meetings and QA sessions, uh, weekly or bi-weekly. It's really, really important part of, of you know, uh, accepting the technology at the organization. Also, I should mention that also saying hello to, to convert guys. It sometimes gives too much freedom compared to, uh, to SAS and in general. So it's really good to have some guidelines, examples, uh, show best practices, how um, we suggest uh, people should automate their jobs, how they should just work with which type of Git, etc., etc. So it's really good to have this. Uh, some kind of library with videos recorded with some uh, guides done so really really necessary and it, it really helped help us so the, those are things that uh, help especially less touchy users also our team provides uh, several pre-built docker images that contain all necessary data connectors uh, that worked out of the box like uh, that i mentioned uh, Oracle, Impala, Hadoop, Snowflake, etc. Just people can, users can just grab this image and start working right from it. And they don't have to worry about installation, any configuration of utilities. That's, that's all works from out of the box. Also recommended practice. Um, what probably I will do differently is that I will start from, start off from a better infrastructure from the first part. From the first part, initially we just had uh, like a zoo of machines, uh, like leftovers from different other projects. And the good point that Converge could uh, unite them under the Kubernetes uh, servers and uh, unite them into a single platform. This was good, but uh, also you know just some machines are really old and we gradually replacing them with, with the newer ones. So if you had a had the opportunity uh, to start off with a like dedicated infrastructure just for Converge. I think it's going to be easier than uh, well, later on if you decide to switch to Converge. Um, also, just uh, it's, it's really good to have a dedicated test instance. Uh, it especially was important at the early stage when Converge was uh, maturing uh, and had more bugs than, than now. So but yeah, even now uh, having a test instance uh, is uh, is beneficial. We, we still uh, we run new new versions through the test instance and then run our own tests on on Converge to make sure our own you know automations work on there and only then we deploy uh, the, the new version production environment. And just uh, recent uh, things that we encountered that uh, it's good 
I, I would advise you to, if you install convergent, especially on premise, uh, to eliminate single points of failure. Uh, and surprisingly, we recently ran into very strange problems that uh, we cannot reach Docker Hub. Uh, properly over the network, and because Converge was fetching always uh, the the actual image from Docker Hub, we actually had, a, had some problems because of that. Uh, the problem was not on Converge; it was on the network. But uh, it's it's good to you know eliminate uh, all the possible single points of failure of Docker Hub. So now we are moving to towards having uh, our own uh, registry, which just which does not depend on on, on Docker Hub. Uh, yeah, so uh, just to summarize uh, briefly, I've shared with you this, uh, my, our experience from uh, migration from SaaS to Converge at Wargaming. That's what we've done. I think it was a quite successful uh, story. And uh, I'd like to, at this point, thank you. And feel free to reach out to me at, at email if you have one i'm happy to answer my, uh, my your questions and uh, lastly i'd like to thank uh, my wife anastasia romano who helped me uh, with uh, beautiful be beautifulization of, of the presentation uh, thank you very much and uh, yeah i'm really open to uh, have your questions Thank you so much, Pavel. That was really, really helpful. And this is also the first that I'm hearing from you. I know we've heard from other people in your team, but I'm really happy to hear it from you. Um, and I swear to God, everybody, we did not pay him to come here. <laughs> Pavel came on his own. And we have some Thank awesome you. questions, and we just have a few minutes. Um, so one question from the audience was, uh, how are the model results? For example, segmentations, predictions being used in wargaming. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, speaking about segmentation, right? We let's let's talk about probably the most uh, important one, the called behavioral segmentation. It, it splits audience into several segments, like around ten, and uh, each each segment has very specific behavior, and uh, so then all, all reporting will merge vast majority of the reporting is looked as a whole, as a whole audience, but also through the eyes of each segment. Uh, so, for example, this new feature was received very well by, let's say, most engaged audience, but it was not very well received by most paying audience. So was it a good feature or not good a feature? So this kind of analysis is done using the segmentation. So basically, the segmentation propagates to all analytic reportings to... That, that is done in the company. These behavioral segmentations, as an example. Speaking about scorings, uh, we have a separate department uh, called Live Ops Operation, Live Operations, and uh, they curate manual and automatic campaigns based on scorings. For example, uh, scorings, uh, we have a scoring of, of churn, right? So we know that this group of people is very likely to, churn, to, to leave the game. And there is could be some actions that can be done, you know, to just try to engage these people, like some, I don't know, some personal missions or some some present be done. And also it depends on which group of people we are talking to, we are, we are looking at, because it's uh, not only just uh, uh, scoring that they are going to leave, but which people are they paying, are they not paying, are they active, are they not active uh, previously. So it depends on, on, on the scoring and other parameters. There is some automatic or, or manual campaigns that are being run uh, uh, by another team.